Hi everyone, I'm Alex and welcome back to our channel. Well, a couple of days ago I had been cleaning in my shed and there I found uh, this amazing piece of history that looks like it would come straight from the Fallout universe. Except uh, it did not because it came from Chernobyl. So this device is DP-3V, which is a Soviet vehicle mounted on board radiation meter. Originally, this thing was designed for nuclear war conditions, uh, so they were normally installed on APCs, helicopters, trucks, engineering tanks, and so on. And it was to say they got a very wide use from the very first days of the Chernobyl disaster, because they were a part of the BRDM-2, it's a Soviet armored uh, reconnaissance patrolling vehicle, uh, that uh, you, for example, can see on this very famous footage uh, from the last days of a live Pripyat. So, after the reactor explosion, there appeared a lot of submicron fraction uh, radioactive dust that contained a lot of various isotopes, and all of that was lifted with the wind and then fell on a big territory. Now, with the rains uh, or just naturally, and uh, to actually understand this disposition, first they use it uh, the flying airborne laboratories, uh, which really made many, many, many flights across this territory, and using the special gamma visors, it's kind of a camera like device that can see fields of radiation, they got the very first uh, contamination maps. By the way, on our Patreon we have a previously unknown report about how exactly it was done and we translated it to English, so you can find it there, a link is in the description below, you should check it. But uh, when it came to the further study, exactly already on a ground level, this BRDM2 with their DP3 devices, like our today's hero, became really handy. The thing is, they can measure radiation up to 500 rangians per hour, which roughly can be converted to 5 zeverts per hour. Well, pretty an astronomical level, isn't it? Well, I'm actually really curious if you have in your country as kind of similar devices uh, which are on board, uh, so let me know in the comments if you ever have seen one, I would like to learn more about that. So, let's look closer. The device consists of the operator's unit and a huge detector that had to be installed somewhere at the bottom of the vehicle. Well, as it is for the onboard use, it has such a connection block, uh, which, uh, using which you provide it either with 12 or up to 29 volts, depending on the device modification. All of this comes to the operator's unit via heavily protected cables and these amazing industrial connectors. Well, I must say that in fact they are really cool because they are often watertight and provide a pretty reliable contact. The overall design is very typical for military equipment of the times. Very sturdy, a lot of metal, a lot of rubber, everything is sealed and uh, this is not an exception. The operator's unit is mounted on such a kind of cradle that has uh, rubber pods to reduce the effects of vibration during driving. But, to be honest, that looks more like a precaution, because the device is that sturdy that when it fell on a concrete floor in my shed, it made kind of irreversible damage to it. So here we have a meter that has two scales, uh, then a switch and a couple of signal lights. The switch purpose is to set up the operation range, very typical thing for analog dosimeters. And actually there are four of them. First one is from 0.1 to 1 rangian per hour, which is roughly can be converted to 1 millisievert to 10 millisieverts per hour. The second one is from 1 to 10 rangians, respectively 10 millisieverts to 100 millisieverts per hour. The third one is from 10 to 100 rangians per hour, which is already serious because it's from 100 millisieverts per hour to 1 zievert per hour. And the last one range is 500 rangians, which is roughly 5 zieverts per hour. 
must say this is a really really high level and one hour of presence of human in this field of radiation will guarantee it, uh, give the heaviest uh, radiation sickness and if no treatment uh, applied immediately uh, practically guaranteed death in a pretty short period of time. Below is a rubberized button to check the socket and above is this metal panel with a few short instructions for the operator. It says that if you have the first range selected you can make a test by pressing that button um, the meter should show you from 0.4 to 0.8 rangens. Then it said that if you have any of three lower ranges chosen you should use the upper scale of the meter, but if you are on 500 rangeons, you should use already the lower one. And uh, there are these two signal lamps, so instruction says that frequency of their flashing will increase with the intensity of the radiation. Specifically, the red one is to show these impulses, and the green one is in fact a tiny window where you can see the current range. Well, I find this a little bit funny because green in equipment indicators normally means normal or okay condition. But well, from another hand, uh, if you have 500 rangeons around you, it's already too late to worry about. So, well, it can be green. It's already normal. Okay, let's take a look inside. Uh, to be honest, I do not expect anything really special inside, but I want to see an overall, let's say, design approach. So first we need to remove this knob and the um, device has two panels, uh, both of them have four screws and each two of the screws are sealed. Um, the seals are not broken, they already solidified, so we mm, you know, need, need some efforts and I expect that you should see the internals in their condition how they were 40 or more years ago placed in this tiny metal box. Well, it's really not too easy to break the seals, but let's try. So, this is what it looks like. It is, you know, very from the 60s. Uh, this is what the military equipment of the times always looked like. A lot of metal, all precisely made, brushed surfaces, all well organized. You know, they didn't really count money on that. And uh, all of these with a varnish on a solder points. Uh, well, love that huge transistors, by the way. What is interesting, um, this lamp here, it actually um, glows uh, to two sides. One uh, to the this movable indicator that is mechanically connected uh, to, to the selection of the mode of operation of the range. And from another side, uh, there is a window in a meter, so the light also goes there. Well, pretty neatly made. And you can change this lamp from outside, uh, not from inside. And here is also a neon lamp, uh, which will flash if you have impulse. Okay, so I assembled that back, and uh, let's open the back one, because in the front one there is not so much to see. So, to do this we again need to uh, deal with the lot of screws, we need to remove the mount and this is done via removing two M3 nuts and then you just push the device out. And then also again that sealed panel, dry it absolutely on the place because it has a rubber like insulation against moisture and this seals are also hard and this is what we have. So, basically nothing super special, the detector gives impulses, they get a bit amplified and then we have a reading corresponding to them depending on the range selected, all done in an analog way. But all this, I have to say, was made here pretty beautiful. It is not a style of electronics I like, um, you know, this 3D mounting of components, it looks for me a little bit crude. But that is a signature mark of that very epoch. Many devices were like this, even civilian. And uh, here we have a few adjustable resistors, each for the range and also one for the frequency of impulses. So basically calibration stuff. By the way, interesting how often this had to be calibrated. 
Okay, next let's take a look to the detector. Uh, it's really huge and also it has such a mount for installation on board, uh, then a watertight connector and overall it looks pretty sealed. I really wonder what's inside, assuming its size, uh, so let's open. First, we have to remove the mount, it holds just on two screws, pretty convenient, and then again we have four screws, two of which are sealed tightly, so again we need to remove that and it takes a lot of efforts, we need to use a small screwdriver to remove the bits of that substance and uh, then somehow try to you know, rotate it, it's really always a big headache to deal with these seals, um, but what we can do. Wow, this is the detector. Wow. Well, to be honest, I do not remember all the detectors that were produced at back then, so this one I frankly do not recall. So if you know the type, please let me know in the comments, surely it's a Geiger tube, I think. Wow, that's huge. Here on that little socket board we have a few neon tubes as well and a resistor to adjust the operation, probably kind of calibration as well. And all of this is packed to the stamped aluminum cylinder. Again, all precise and all well made. Okay, and the last is this power adapter, let's call it this way. Also two screws and again dry rubber insulation, you can use a screwdriver to open it. Uh, well, inside is actually nothing, so this is more like a wire box. I do not think there is a real need to attempt to try to power it all on, because the levels it is designed for are really high as for the current times, it will simply not react. But all in all, it's pretty cool historical artifact. So that what it looks like. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel because we're gonna have more reviews like this and other equipment and also historical insights about the Chernobyl. And if you want much more, please join us on our Patreon page because there you will find full version of our videos, archive materials, as well as many translated things uh, that are virtually not known to the Western audience. And see you next time.